Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. And this is The Philosopher's Stone by Montford W. Smith. An article from Rosicrucian Digest, number 24, volume 12, January 1974. The Philosopher's Stone by Montford W. Smith. As I look back upon my present life, I realize that, unconsciously and instinctively, I have always been searching for the Philosopher's Stone. I felt that if man could find the secret of the construction of the atom, he would find the essential creative force which is back of all the manifestation of the physical universe, and the secrets of nature would be revealed. Man could transmute one element into another, and any material could be made from any other material. Upon discovering the source of all this manifestation, it would become known whether or not there is such a thing as God. Of course, this would have to be done by using the latest findings of modern scientists about the atom. As I grew older, the science of nuclear physics developed more and more, and after getting a good background in physics and chemistry in college, I went to a university in order to specialize in nuclear physics. I believed that modern scientists had at least found the Philosopher's Stone in the form of a cyclotron. True, it was much bigger than many stones and the amount of material transmuted by it was pitifully small compared to anything practical. Yet it was shown that transmutation of elements was a fact and that the rate could be only to a small degree controlled by man. In contrast to the uncontrollable rate of disintegration found in radioactive elements, this process, however, gave some hope that man could discover the secret of atomic power maybe in 50 or 100 years. In 1939, a new process of nuclear reactions was discovered, namely, nuclear fission. The atom, instead of being merely chipped as had heretofore been done, was now actually split. An atom of uranium, when bombarded by a neutron, would actually split into two unequal fragments and in addition give off two or three neutrons, which could again bombard another atom, which would give off more neutrons and bombard more atoms and so on, thus forming a chain reaction. Once started, no complicated device such as a cyclotron was necessary because the process of neutronic bombardment furnished its own bombarding particles. However, there was something strange about this. Why hadn't all the uranium in the world long since blown itself up when started by a stray neutron? It was found that only one isotope, that which has an atomic mass number of 235, was effective in the process. It was only present in ordinary uranium to the extent of one part in 140. The other uranium atoms, which had a mass number of 238, not only did not react in the presence of slow neutrons, but they also absorbed the neutrons and prevented them from reaching with the few U-235 atoms which were present. I believe that the only way to make it work was to separate the isotopes. Little did I realize that eventually scientists would actually create a new element, number 94, and with a mass number of 239, now called plutonium. For just as the planet Pluto is two planets beyond Uranus, plutonium is two elements beyond uranium. This element, because it was chemically different from uranium, could be separated from it by ordinary chemical means rather than by the clumsy physical methods used for separating isotopes. Why it was that we heard little more about the tremendous possibilities of atomic power seemed a mystery to me until 1942 when I learned that the War Department had taken the experiment over and had stopped the publication of anything about it. Yet, in my mind, the dream of being able to separate the isotopes and thus obtain the modern scientific equivalent of the Philosopher's Stone never left me and I hope to be able to do some research on it as work towards my degree. The war put a stop to my studying, however, and it was necessary for me to find an essential job. Still, I didn't want to settle down to anything short of work on uranium isotopes. Within a week or so of such determining, 
I found myself 2,500 miles away, working on the separation of the uranium isotopes at the University of California in Berkeley. The unbalancing of polarity. What an awful secrecy pervaded the place. What an embittered feeling I had when I realized how tremendous a financial expenditure was going into such a wonderful thing that was only to be used for destructive purposes. Modern science and scientists had failed to realize that men and all that exists is in dual form. They, seeing only the material side of the duality, neglected the spiritual side. The polarity had become unbalanced and disaster seemed to result. I could not put my soul into the work because the soul was left entirely without consideration in that type of work. Even intellectual satisfaction was stymied since few persons were allowed to get a whole picture of what was going on. Later I was sent to New Mexico where another part of the project was located. In two days I learned the astounding details of how they were planning to make and test the gadget as the atomic bomb was then called. I often wondered, what if the world at large knew about the tremendous destructive force we were deploying? I listened to lectures by world famous scientists and thought about all the complicated ways in which man does simple things and many times into my mind came the words, the wisdom of this world is foolish with God. One day as I was glancing through a magazine my attention was attracted to the advertisement of an occult and metaphysical organization. I had an irresistible urge to send for their literature. New avenues of thought were opened up to me. The lost polarity of the scientific world which had been reflected in and indeed is reflected in the average individual of our materialistic minded world seemed to be regained to a certain extent. I had an irresistible desire for spiritual knowledge, even as in previous years I had an irresistible desire for material knowledge. I often considered the thought, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the world and lose his soul? Even in the midst of the largest scientific investigation the world has ever known, I found the occult knowledge even more interesting. This is not to infer that the material side of life is unimportant but that the perfect balance between the spiritual and the material is far more important than either one alone. Cosmically Conscious To me, the Philosopher's Stone is more than a material object which has the power of transmuting elements. It is something within man which makes him an integrated individual. The Philosopher's Stone makes possible the condition of perfect balance between the spiritual and the material which makes it possible for one to go to and return from either extreme at will. Once that balance were obtained, it would be unnecessary to have a material object for transmutation processes. Projection of the consciousness at will into the depths of the material and the heights of the spiritual would give man power over all things. This power cannot be obtained without balance. One cannot have perfect balance on all planes without becoming one with the cosmic consciousness. One cannot become one with the cosmic consciousness without being in harmony with the cosmic law and plan. We thus see the tremendous powers conferred on one when he attains the philosopher's stone or cosmic consciousness. We thus see that the tremendous powers conferred on one when he attains the philosopher's stone or cosmic consciousness can be exercised only when the individual unit of such consciousness, the soul of man, has moral purposes. Morality resolves itself down to harmony with cosmic law. Man, being a world within himself, contains everything within himself. In the physical world it is impossible for one thing to be contained within another, and simultaneously for the other thing to be contained in the one. Three-dimensional illusion is dispensed with when, at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. The old occult adage rings out, man, know thyself, and thou knowest all. This latter statement epitomizes the way of mysticism, which is the way of the heart. By the way of mysticism, man first finds the divine within himself, and thus is enabled to recognize it in all things. 
by the way of accordism, man tries to find the divine within matter, and in finding it there, also finds it within himself, harmonizing with the divine. In a way, the old alchemists were much further advanced than the modern scientists, for they did not lose sight of the divine in matter. In another way, the scientists of today are much further than the alchemists of old, because they have systematized material knowledge. The time is coming when the systematization of material science will be applied to harmonizing the divine with the material. We thus see that alchemy is the forerunner and the successor of modern science. If modern scientists are to restore the balance of polarity of their approach to knowledge, they must first balance the polarity within themselves. In other words, they must overcome the negation of the physical plane, because the unbalance is usually on the physical plane. Then they are sure to approach the attainment of the Philosopher's Stone. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.